Welcome back to the President's massive 2019 budget. Congress has now received the President's $4.4 trillion spending proposal, which includes a $1.5 trillion infrastructure investment. But the budget plan is expected to add to the deficit, and the federal government is already on track to borrow $955 billion this fiscal year, according to a U.S. Treasury report released earlier this month. Joining me right now in a Fox Business exclusive is the Speaker of the House, Speaker Paul Ryan. Speaker Ryan, it's great to see you. Great to be back. Good Thank morning. you so much for joining us this morning. We have a lot to get to, and I'll a lot of people are talking about the Republicans right now, not in a good way in terms of your two-year deal uh, last week. I want to talk about the president's budget today, but first let me start on your budget sure. uh, because, of course, uh, we're, we're talking about uh, out-of-control spending, is how one person put it, leading to trillion-dollar deficits for 10 years. Another person talked about it. Mulvaney admitting uh, his, his budget doesn't balance in 10 years. Mo Brooks talking about the two-year budget deal uh, and an additional $300 billion in spending. It's the worst piece of legislation I've ever voted on. Tell me how you <laughs> looking at that too. Well, I kind of disagree with Mo on that. Uh, this was a discretionary budget about getting the military their budget. As you know, the military has been deteriorating, hollowed out. So we are really focused on getting the military their budget because they need a budget that they can plan for. We've hollowed out the four structures for the last eight years. The discretionary budget that we have now is still lower than the budget that we had put in place in 2011 that we passed. So if you remember, you go back to the BCA, actually was budget chair then, the discretionary spending we have today is lower than the levels we were envisioning back in 2011. And the other point I would simply make is the sequester, no one intended the sequester to kick in, let alone do what it did to the military. So we want to rebuild our military, and we did a few things since those days. We've put in about $250 billion of permanent mandatory spending cuts in that course of time. And this bill, we have Medicare means testing we've added to it. We got rid of the Independent Payment Advisory Board, a big down payment on health care reform. So we've actually done some things in this bill that we think are pretty important. But yeah, we did have more domestic spending. And the domestic spending we put in here is pretty much one-time spending, disaster aid, uh, infrastructure aid, in exchange for getting the military budget we wanted. Yeah, but do, were do there... We, here's the question. we got to get on entitlements. Yeah. And so this was a discretionary spending budget. This wasn't a full macro budget. This was discretionary spending. And for us... Save the military, one-time spending for hurricanes, disaster, get some spending cuts that will grow in the out years. But we do have to go back <clears throat> and focus on entitlement spending. The House Republicans passed the biggest entitlement reform um, package ever when we passed our health care bill. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, somebody did this instead of that right. in the Senate, and it didn't pass. Yeah. We passed a budget before that that cut $7.4 trillion in spending over 10 years in the House. The problem is we have to get our other partners in government to, to be willing to do the kind of entitlement reform that we're willing to do in the House. Which is why people are surprised at you, because you've been this entitlement like reform said, we've, person we've been and a deficit hawk for That's years, right. and you and mentioned still am. Running, running the budget, but you don't look like you are well, based on this budget I know, this last isn't week. because this is a full I mean, budget. This is discretionary spending. Well, you mentioned discretionary. I mean, you're, you're also a big boost to abstinence education, $7 billion in community health centers, uh, child care grants. So it's more than just the disaster relief it, yeah, and, and infrastructure. That's true. So this is a Did you have to agree deal. to that stuff just to get the military yes. money? Yeah, yeah, we had to. You have to give to get. So we had to do some domestic spending that the Democrats wanted so we could get our, our defense spending. We got a lot of the spending cuts we wanted that they didn't want either. So, yes, this was a bipartisan compromise. You don't get everything you want. And what I would simply say is look at what the House has already proven our ability to do on entitlements. We have passed every year since we've been in the majority, every, every, every term, big entitlement savings, the problem we have is we can't get these things through the Senate. Our health care bill, people look at it as the repeal and replace bill. That was an, an enormous entitlement reform bill right. for Medicaid, for Obamacare. We passed it out of the House. We couldn't get it through the Senate. So, yeah, we've got more to do on entitlements, on mandatory spending. We added more me Medicare means testing in this particular bill. So we think we're making progress on that. But what we have to make sure is we don't hollow out our military. Right. And there is a serious problem with our military that needed addressing. And so, sure, when you're getting a bipartisan compromise, sometimes there's some spending you have to accept to get what you need in order to do that. And our priority was getting the military the budget they needed. But now we're in a different environment. So you, you passed the tax legislation, and now we're seeing economic growth. With economic growth has come inflation, has come higher wages, is coming perhaps higher interest rates. Okay. And now it's in your face in terms of how much you're going to be spending on the debt. So, so $50 billion additional a year just on the interest rate. No payments. two ways about it. We had to go out for mandatory. I would say core inflation, I think PCE is like 1.52 right now. Right, so we'll I don't it. think we have inflation getting out of the gates. But yet. interest rates are moving higher and the markets are trading and, wildly and as a result. interest rates should be normalizing, by the way. And, and the way we look at this is 
The Fed has been carrying all of the water. We've been doing the Fed with loose, easy money for many years since the recession because we had horrible fiscal policy, overregulation, higher taxes. What are we doing now? We're getting regulatory relief. We're getting tax reform, long time in coming. And so now the fiscal policy authorities are actually taking over the work of getting growth in the economy so that the monetary policy authorities don't have to do that. So we can start normalizing interest rates. We want to have rates being normalized. And I think we're going through that transition right now. But at the end of the day, I'm the same old guy. We're doing the same old thing in, in the House which is we've got to have entitlement reform, and that is why we keep pushing for our health care reform. That's why we keep pushing for entitlement reform. So what's realistic then? I mean, you're obviously not going to make any changes in an election year. Yeah, I Listen to this. This is I the op-ed in the journal today. Uh, income transfers like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, food stamps, among other things, that category was 47.7% of outlays right. in 89. Right. Right. Today it's 69.2% of outlays, and that doesn't include the net interest on the debt, yeah, which so, is another 7.5%. So these deficits uh, that you saw from Mulvaney's budget yesterday, those are stuff stubborn structural deficits we saw before this, this discretionary agreement. And you know why? Baby boomers are retiring and we're not ready for them. We have a structural deficit increase because of our entitlement spending. That is why, and the biggest, the biggest driver of it is health care entitlements. This is why the, one of the biggest casualties of a, a narrow Senate of that bill not passing was not getting health care entitlement reform. We've got to reform our health care entitlements. That is why we can never give up on reforming health care because if you reform health care, then you take care of the structural drivers of our debt, like Medicare and Medicaid. And, and the Graham Cassidy Obamacare repeal bill almost passed the Senate last year. This is one area where the president has said this is maybe should be the focus. Are you going to try this again this year? Well, I think there are a lot of things we can do kind of incrementally. First of all, in this bill that we just passed, we got Medicare means testing. We repealed the IPAB. We got rid of some Obamacare slush funds. So we, we also repealed the individual mandate in the tax bill. So we've been doing incremental gains on health care reform when, when we realized we couldn't get it done in one fell swoop when the House bill didn't pass the Senate. So what are your expectations for these trillion dollar deficits? I mean, you know, we're talking about trillion dollar deficits for the next 10 years and then after a decade, no, no, Miami McGinnis. We're talking McGinnis, about it as far as exactly, the eye can see Exactly. And Miami McGinnis it's going to be 2 trillion dollars after that's a right. decade. So that's because of demographics. It's not the military. If we could get we could abolish the Pentagon today, we'd still have a deficit. So we don't want to sacrifice our military while we focus on the real drivers of the debt, which is entitlements. And that is why, and it's really the health care entitlements, quite frankly. Uh, Social Security is, 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 is a part of a, of a solvency problem. They have a solvency problem, but nothing like we do on the health care entitlements. So that's why we can never give up on health care reform, because that is the key driver of our debt in the future which is demographically driven. It's a combination of demographics and healthcare inflation. You fix healthcare, you fix the debt crisis. Just saying we have to get our arms and not stop mm -hmm. on healthcare and our efforts to get costs down is not enough for the markets. The markets well, may push your hand. We're seeing thousand point decline, just seeing nervousness I'll take about these it gets deficits. To get us to move. Like I said, we passed this bill in the House already. We've done this in the House. We've not been able to get these, these bills passed in, in the Senate or, or over the finish line. So what do you do? Well, what do you, we what's keep, a realistic in, solution here? What speaker? we try to do was do it all in the House bill with repeal and replace. Like I said, we passed it. And that bill, one guy in the Senate did this instead of that, and that, that went down. That would have been the biggest entitlement reform bill ever passed by Congress. So what are we doing? We're going back and doing it incrementally, going back at incremental health care reform and other entitlement reforms so we can chip away at this problem. That is what we I think the, the best chance we have is going after incremental entitlement reform since the fact that the Senate couldn't pass it.